first of all, to disarm the targeted population that would be subject to that government. Street demonstrators turn the area of the World Trade Organization conference into a war zone. Over 500 National Guardsmen and state police are called in to help restore order in what became known as the Battle of Seattle. The major media focused on the chaos and the mob's demands. Let them go! Yet they carefully avoided raising the issue as to how the groups on the street were organized and funded, or whether their leaders might have a hidden agenda. Instead, the media portrays such demonstrations as natural outpourings of genuine grassroots concern. We're just normal people who are tired of the exploitation of multinational corporations. Again, for those who orchestrate these events, it's the illusion that counts. The, the familiar media melodrama of the anti-globalization movement that we have seen in Seattle and some of the other protest venues is really a classic example of bracketing an issue with false alternatives because we're told that these are people who oppose the global agenda. After all, they're called anti-globalization activists. Well, what is it that they oppose? They don't oppose global government. They believe that there is too much free market capitalism in the world and that government at a global level has to be more assertive in imposing controls over the free exchange of goods and services. But you see that both of these sides are really calling for empowering the United Nations. The media further stage manages the illusion of conflict by promoting those designated as the official opposition. I'm going to focus on what the other side says and then what you say back. <laughs> the media appointed spokesperson for the anti-WTO forces is Laurie Wallach. She heads up Global Trade Watch. Ignored by the media is the fact that Wallach's organization receives funding from the Ford Foundation, which is closely tied to the CFR. The friendly relationship between Wallach and the CFR agenda was made clear in Foreign Policy magazine, a major conduit for CFR thinking. This issue signals media leaders that Lori Wallach should be represented as an expert on trade issues. By ensuring that only false opposition is offered to its revolutionary agenda, the CFR internationalists can't lose. The establishment media employs many deceptions to support the drive for global power. These deceptions go far beyond altering or omitting a few facts. The insiders count on the immensity of their illusions to prevent any sizable segment of the American public from catching on to their real motivation. CEO of the John Birch Society, G. Vance Smith. A basic objective of the insiders, and has been from the beginning, has been to break the will to resist, to convince through their propaganda that there's uh, no hope, uh, that it's inevitable, that moving towards a, a one world government, a one world court system, a one world military, a one world currency, all of that is, is just inevitable. And they present it in a way that uh, again convinces, uh, it tr they try to convince that, the, that it's that the momentum is so great that it cannot be stopped. But more than once, the insider's momentum has been stopped. As Clinton began his second term, he chose veteran CFR member W. Anthony Lake for the highly sensitive post of director of the CIA. But Senate approval would be required first. 
the establishment news quickly filled its editorial pages with glowing endorsements from fellow CFR members. But many issues in Lake's background should have raised doubts about his suitability for the top intelligence post. Of greatest concern was Lake's long history of associations with groups hostile to American national security. A group of political watchdogs supplied key senators with documentation, and the New American magazine helped mobilize public pressure for a thorough investigation. Embarrassed by the challenge to its leadership, the establishment media attempted to smear the organization, leading the demand for the investigation. Lake is a victim of the far right, the New York Times charged. In an error-ridden article in the New American, a John Birch periodical, William F. Jasper dissected Mr. Lake's resume and found a pattern of anti-Americanism. He referred to my article as an error-ridden article, yet he cited not one error in the whole article, and it was clearly a uh, calculated to be a, a major defense and promo piece for Anthony Lake. Despite strong media support for his nomination, Lake withdrew rather than subject himself to serious Senate scrutiny. Victories such as Lake's withdrawal are but part of the solution for reversing the establishment's momentum. To escape ongoing media deceptions, the public must first have a source of regular, reliable information. Many concerned Americans look to the new American the magazine has a reputation for calling the shots years and sometimes decades ahead of mainstream media. Case in point, author William F. Jasper examines Osama bin Laden three years before the attack on the Pentagon and the World Trade Center. Jasper's report exposes the cover-up that prevents America from winning the war on terrorism. The New American reveals how Washington policymakers had earlier helped build Saddam Hussein's war machine and are using the monster they created as a pretext to build UN power. Newsweek covered some of this ground, although not until 10 years later. To know what's going on isn't going to help a darn bit unless we do something with what we know. And again, an individual, even well informed, it can't stop this thing by himself. So the purpose of our educational efforts is to get thousands and tens and tens of thousands of individuals informed so that they can link arms and they can collectively have a voice that will resonate even as great as the billions of dollars uh, resonate through the media. Truth will penetrate all of that. Truth. It's the foundation upon which freedom is built. And it's one of the strongest weapons against the revolutionary agenda behind the big news. <laughs>